I'm Dr. James King. I'm a senior lecturer in physiology at um, Loughborough University in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences. Um, I want to welcome everybody to what is the first of five in this autumn series of our lifestyle education sessions for healthcare professionals. As a very brief background, we did something similar to this um, going back before COVID. So I think it was the autumn of 2019. And these were in-person sessions, actually, where the, the, the purpose of our our kind of our, our public lectures was to provide some information, um, particularly targeted at healthcare professionals, but also for anybody with a general interest in the area, but very much around lifestyle, um, using diet and physical activity to improve a whole host of different aspects of, of our health. Tonight is the first session, and um, it's great that I've also got with me Dr. Scott Willis and Professor Letty Bishop, who will both um, also give talks. So my talk, as you can see on this, um, sorry, my talk as you can see on this particular slide here relates to energy expenditure. Um, Scott will talk a little bit later about how different, um, how fat in different area, areas of the body um, links quite uh, tightly to metabolically, metabolic health. And Letty, uh, who will talk at the end, um, will talk more about physical activity and chronic low grade um, inflammation. Um, in terms of questions, so if you can, if you do have any questions, if you can put those, <clears throat> sorry, if you can put those into the chat, we will come to those and try and answer those um, at the end. We will, we will monitor them as we go through. So without any sort of further ado, I'll, I'll start with my presentation now. So this will be around about 25 to 30 minutes, um, and then I'll pass over to Scott, um, and he will do the same, and then to, to Letty uh, as well. So my talk today is around energy expenditure. Um, this is an area where I must sort of put my hands up and say that I'm not um, a fountain of all knowledge in this particular new area of research. It's something that I teach to the undergraduates and I touch upon it from really my own interest in evolutionary biology. Um, but I'm not a complete expert in this area. But given that it's quite a fundamental um, development within our knowledge in this area, I think it's quite an important thing to share with people. Um, it's not that often within our sort of most basic um, disciplines that we, we have new research that is probably going to change the way the textbooks are written when it comes to energy balance. And this, this whole area that I'm going to talk about now is the idea that total daily energy expenditure is a regulated variable and it's regulated given um, our, our evolutionary biology. Um, and basically within this talk, I'm going to sort of outline um, this hypothesis and share some of the, the research that has been used to form this particular hypothesis. So that you can see here, so the key aspect of this idea or this theory, hypothesis, whatever you want to call it, is that the amount of energy or the total amount of energy that we burn each day is a stable, homeostatically regulated trait. And it's grounded in our evolutionary biology in the sense of if you go back millions of millions of years from a survival perspective and passing on of our genes uh, and all of that, it makes no sense for our daily energy expenditure to be really high. So if you expend a lot of energy, you need to be able to find food to cover that energy expenditure. And in, in, in societies, if you go back millions of years, finding food was the one thing that consumed uh, our existence day in day out obviously the environment today is very different and this particular topic has been in focus very recently going back to possibly January February this year there was a book published and the, the chap who's led a lot of this research is Dr Herman Ponza who's now at Duke University North Carolina uh, he studied at Harvard in evolutionary biology so I mean there's, there's lots of people who are working in this area now but Herman Ponza is the chap who has led this if anybody wants to sort of follow up by looking into it. But this was all over the news. If you go back sort of January, February time, I had requests to talk about this on various news outlets. Um, and again, it's, this is very much because this research is really making us rethink um, the, the model for um, energy balance and certainly how total daily energy expenditure operates. So very quickly, I'm going to give you one slide basic on energy balance. And like I said, I'll just um, share the theory and share some of the evidence in the next 20 minutes. So in terms of the basics of energy balance, I know most people here have a decent understanding. 
this is just a textbook diagram that you see in any nutrition sort of um, text that we share with our undergraduates and even postgraduates. Clearly on this set of scales, you can see on the left, all of the factors that contribute to our energy intake, protein, fat, carbohydrate, um, alcohol should be there for some people as well. And then on the right hand side, you can see all of the factors that contribute to our total daily energy expenditure. So that's our rest of metabolic rate, which is around sort of 60 to 70 percent. Um, our thermic effect of feeding, which is TEF. And that's the energy that we have to expend to break down the, 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 uh, the chemical bonds in our food and actually form it into something useful for our body. And then on top of that, physical activity, which is obviously variable, can range from bed rest to, um, you know, somebody doing an Arctic trek or cycling up the Alps and the Tour de France. So we've known, so, so, so I should say with that, when, when those two match, then our uh, uh, energy, we're in energy balance and our weight and body composition is stable. But clearly deviations, whether in positive or negative energy balance, will lead to our weight going up or down. We've known increasingly in the last sort of uh, probably 10 years or even more, that actually what we eat has a direct impact on our energy expenditure. So there's already a link between our food intake and our total daily energy expenditure. And as an example, if we go on a diet and we try and lose weight, we're in negative energy balance. We know that reduces our rest and metabolic rate as the body tries to conserve energy. We know it makes us more lethargic. We don't move around as much. And if you're eating less, the amount of energy you burn digesting food goes down. So we know that there's already a connection. And, and we, because of that, we talk about energy balance being a dynamic model. The new concept, however, is this that's shown here. And that's the fact that our physical activity and the energy we burn through physical activity seems to be Im impacting on our resting metabolism. So when we do more physical activity, uh, the allocation of energy within our body changes. So we actually direct energy away from energetically expensive processes like growth, repair, reproduction and so on. And they, they kind of distill um, this sentiment down into two models. So we have the old traditional model that, you know, is in most of our textbook. And this is referred to as the additive model you can see on the left. So the important part on this diagram is you can see the dotted line going from left to right, which is flat across the screen. That is non-metabolic physical activity. So that's just like our basal expenditure for things like growth, repair, body maintenance, reproduction, immune function, digestion, and so on. And in this model, that stays static, irrespective of how much physical activity we do. So in this um, diagram, you can see as we go um, left to right on the X axis, we do more physical activity and we get this linear increase in total daily energy expenditure. So basically, the, the amount of energy you burn in physical activity compared to sort of body maintenance um, are cl completely independent processes. However, what we're saying with this new constraint model is that they're not independent they're linked intricately so as people do more physical activity initially you get this slight increase in total daily energy expenditure um, but then what happens with more physical activity you then get a decrease in energy allocated to all of those other important bodily processes so the net effect overall is you get this plateauing out of total energy expenditure and like i said at the start that this makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because it maximizes our chances of survival and passing on genes, which is the basis of evolutionary biology. Um, I should say before I show any evidence, a huge breakthrough in a lot of this research has been the use of doubly labeled water, which is the best technique that we have for measuring total daily energy expenditure. And this is as accurate as whole room respiration chambers. So if we use, um, you know, in our labs, we use breath by breath, uh, respirometry to measure oxygen consumption energy expenditure we also have at certain universities basically small offices where you can go in and live for a day or two and you get a very um, very accurate measurement of energy expenditure by looking at oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production doubly labeled water is a bit different but the accuracy is similar i'm not going to go through this in detail the, the the main point to note is it's very very expensive it's about thousand pounds to get a measurement of free living total daily energy expenditure over about two week period. Um, essentially it involves individuals consuming stable isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen. And by measuring or by looking at urine samples, we look at how those isotopes are eliminated from the body over that period of time. 
and we're able to determine carbon dioxide production and in turn oxygen consumption, which gives us a nice accurate measurement of energy expenditure. And actually the initially, if you go back 20 or even 30 years, this technique was used on rodents because you only need a very small amount of these isotopes, which was financially viable. But as more people have used this technique, um, it's become more financially viable to use it in larger doses, and that's enabled more research to be done. So that's that's key a key part of a lot of this research is actually being able to measure total daily energy expenditure, which includes everything in terms of our basal metabolic rate, um, physical activity we do, and the energy used to consume to digest food. So in terms of evidence around this, then I'll start with some basic ecological studies, some really interesting trials that have been done, again, by Herman Ponser and, and lots of his team. Seems to have a lot of colleagues who work in zoos because one of the first studies, um, one of the most interesting studies um, in this area was actually measuring total daily energy expenditure in animals who were either in captivity compared to those who were in the wild. So just trying to get my head around how feasibly they would actually do this in terms of administering the isotopes and getting urine samples from some of these animals because although I don't have a picture here they actually did this on silverback gorillas so I wouldn't be volunteering for that myself but suffice to say you can see three examples here that were reported in the paper lemurs chimpanzees and red kangaroos and when you compare the total daily energy expenditure of these animals whether they're in a zoo and essentially in captivity or out in the wild where presumably they're doing more physical activity, the actual total daily energy expenditure is no different. So we would have expected that the total energy expenditure in the wild would have been quite a bit higher than animals in zoos, but it isn't. And that's suggesting that there is some sort of cap or constraint or regulation on total energy expenditure. In terms of humans, Ponce and his team have done a lot of work with various different populations across the world. They've done a lot of work, as shown in this particular study, with Hazda foragers. So the Hazda tribe are a group of people who live in northern Tanzania, um, and they live basically a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. In this study, they also looked at Bolivian farmers, and they compared the total daily energy expenditure of those particular populations to Westerners, who live a very inactive, sedentary lifestyle, as we all know. They used, again, the doubly labelled water to look at total energy expenditure. They also used GPS to look at the distance walked, going about uh, the individual's day-to-day -day, um, um, activities. And what the graph essentially shows that when you correct for differences in body size, because the Westerners who have access to lots of food tend to be bigger, so will expend more energy any, anyway, so you have to correct for body size. But when you do correct for body size, the actual total daily energy expenditure or the amount of energy burned overall each day was no different between this hunter-gatherer population, a farming population in Bolivia, or Westerners sitting down all day. So again, even though you can see at the bottom there in the left-hand box, the Hazda, uh, the Hazda men were walking uh, 11 kilometres per day and the women were walking 6 kilometres per day, um, there was no difference in overall total daily energy expenditure. If you look at even meta-analysis data on this, so in this particular study, they looked at the doubly labelled water, in, uh, measured total energy expenditure in 98 different studies. Um, and what they did in this particular analysis, they were looking at different samples who varied based on their degree of development and industrialization. So the idea being that more developing countries um, have a lifestyle with more physical activity and more industrialised societies have a more sedentary existence. And again, you guessed it, um, from this particular meta-analysis, they concluded that there was no differences um, in total daily energy expenditure uh, between these different populations. So although there's limitations in this sort of um, cross-sectional ecological data, it is all pointing to um, a picture that suggests that actually really active animals or human beings aren't necessarily burning more energy than Westerners. Uh, which is a little bit surprising when you first hear. Uh, one last study in this particular section I've got is this, this other one, which again, is this was a smaller sample of 322 men and women. Um, these were populations across Africa and North America, and they used accelerometers to measure physical activity objectively. And again, they also had paired 
um, measurements of total daily energy expenditure, again, using doubly labeled water. The main um, sort of finding to note from this study is shown in the graph. Uh, and what you can see, if you, if you look at the left-hand side of the sort of the yellow line, you can see in the very inactive people, as, as, as uh, activity levels go up, um, you can see that there's a slight increase in total daily energy expenditure, but then that actually plateaus out quite quickly, again, suggesting that despite some people having higher levels um, of physical activity, that isn't matched by a reciprocal increase in total daily energy expenditure. Like I said, there's limitations of sort of cross-sectional data, so you, you also look to um, experimental studies. This is a nice study that was published quite a while ago um, by uh, Klaus Westerterp, who's a bit of a leader in, in the doubly labelled water method. And in this um, experimental study, they took a group of men and women who were training for a half marathon over the course of 44 weeks. And you can see in the red text there, the volume of training increased throughout the, uh, the training period, all the way up to sort of 30 to 90 minutes per week by week 40. And again, they measured um, total energy expenditure with doubly labelled water, and they used a respiration chamber to look at sleep metabolic rate, which was their sort of uh, measurement of basal metabolic rate. And again, if you look at the plot in the middle of the page, you can see the graph for women on the left and the graph for men on the right. Um, you can see what would be predicted in the grey line, so this linear line um, in terms of um, if there was a linear relationship between the amount or volume of physical activity undertaken, we should see that total energy expenditure would follow the grey line. Um, but quite clearly, if you look at the black line, which is the observed total energy expenditure, so the black thick line in the middle, again, you can see after we go from week 20, where there's a, an initial increase, we get this plateau um, throughout the course of the study. So despite um, actually doing a greater volume of physical activity over you know, the best part of a year, Again, we're seeing this plateauing of total energy expenditure. And this finding has been replicated in, I found at least three of the studies that are shown here, all with measurements of total energy expenditure with doubly labelled water, um, showing the same thing. So as the volume of physical activity increases, um, you get a slight increase in energy expenditure to start with, but then that plateaus out. Now, there could be some other reasons that contribute to this. So we know um, that many, many exercise training interventions show that weight loss tends to be less than predicted based on the known energy expenditure of exercise. And it could be one reason for that might be that people start to eat a little bit more. So there's definitely some evidence to suggest, suggest that um, when people embark on a physical activity intervention, there's a partial increase in energy consumption. And it's also possible that people become a little bit more sedentary. So you know, if I've been to the gym and done a hard run, when I get home, I might decide to drive to the shops rather than walk to the shops. And, and, and by changing my behaviour in that regard, I've uh, induced some behavioural compensation. So we still need to probably more clearly pick apart these different factors that, that link to uh, energy compensation. Just looking at the time, I've got nine minutes left. Um, in terms of the implications for weight control and health, the first one, you know, quite clearly, most of you are probably thinking this already, that I guess the suggestion from this evidence is that actually telling people to do more exercise isn't necessarily going to lead to an actual increase in overall total daily energy expenditure. So what this model is suggesting that if we take an individual um, who is currently inactive and you give them a training program to increase the volume of physical activity they do over the course of a few months, Initially, they might increase their total energy output slightly, but, you know, after a short period, it's likely that even if they keep on doing more and more, that their total daily energy expenditure will just plateau and actually the body will then reduce the amount of energy it expends in terms of growth and repair, immune function, reproduction, digestion and so on. And I'll, I'll, I'll show how that happens in a second. Um, but yeah, so it's important from a lot of this research, it seems to be that initially there's an increase in total energy output when we become more active, but then there's a plateau. Um, and again, this, this could contribute to why a lot of people struggle to have success when trying to use exercise as a way to, to lose weight. In terms of more wider health implications, so a couple of examples in this diagram 
um, which was, I've not actually put the citation on here, but this was from a recent review that Herman Ponza led. Um, you know, we, we know very much from elite athletes in terms of immune function. So our elite athletes, particularly our endurance athletes, get ill very often. Um, and one of the reasons could quite clearly be that if they're burning lots of energy through their, their, um, uh, their, their events, then the body is actually reducing the amount of energy it allocates to immune function. And that is contributing to why they're getting ill. So you can see here some examples of what happens with energy stress. So um, in terms of changes in the, the threshold for eliciting immune responses and cytokine production and so on. Um, we know there's evidence showing that chronic exercise is linked to a decrease in both innate and acquired immune function. Um, so if you look at the blue sort of diagram at the top there, you can see the on the left hand side, this sedentary sort of condition that we know is linked to chronic um, inflammation. So an overactivation of the immune system. And the idea would be that as you become moderately active, um, you would reduce the amount of energy allocated to the to immune function. And that could be beneficial um, in the short term or, or why activity levels remain at a sensible level. But if you move to um, doing lots and lots and lots of exercise, like some of our athletes obviously do, then actually that could have adverse consequences for immune function and lead to, to, to athletes becoming overtrained and open to all sorts of infections. Similarly, another good example relates to the, to, um, the reproductive system. So again, we know that individuals who are really, really active um, have a reduction in fertility, whether that's changes in the menstrual cycle, um, so that the menstrual cycle either becoming irregular or even stopping in females or in males as well. Males who are really active have lower testosterone and it can lead to a reduction in sperm quality in men. So there does seem to be some other evidence around this idea that, that suggests if we try and increase activity levels to a high amount, then we do allocate energy away from other important bodily processes that will affect wider aspects of health. And I should say as well, there's, there's lots of evidence as well in animals. So I've been talking a lot about growth and repair. So there's, there's evidence in birds, for example, that are really, really active because they might be migrating. <clears throat> uh, growth and repair of feathers and things like that have been shown to be um, delayed in the very active animals compared to those who are not active. That's essentially my last slide. So there's some take home messages here that I won't sort of read out because I've kind of been through them before. But yeah, this is this is literally a new newish hypothesis that's um, becoming increasingly popular. Um, I've shared the most sort of interesting evidence there. A lot of it um, is really quite complex when you start to drill down into the evolutionary biology and a little bit over my head. So I hope what I've shared there has been tangible and useful for, for most of you. Um, but yeah, the, the, the over, overriding idea being that total daily energy expenditure is regulated um, and that we simply um, don't increase total energy output um, in a linear fashion with our physical activity levels. So I'm very happy to answer any questions. We've got five minutes, I think, now. So if, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try and answer those now. If not, um, then please put the, any questions that you do have in the chat and we'll, we'll try and get to those uh, at the end. So I will stop sharing my screen. Are there any questions now whilst we have a couple of minutes? Just can't see any. Please feel free to put any questions in the chat. Um, if there aren't any now, Scott, I'll pass on to you. Great, thanks, James. So just to, I'll just introduce you, Scott. So Scott is a research associate here in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences. Um, and Scott is going to talk to us today about how all fat is not equal. Great, so I'll just share my screen. Okay, so yeah, obviously, uh, good evening, everyone. James has already um, done my introduction. So um, the session that we'll be going through today is we're going to be looking at the um, location of where we store 
uh, fat within our body and understanding why this uh, body fat distribution may not be equal. And then we'll finish by looking at different lifestyle interventions through both diet and exercise and how it may be able to influence this. So firstly, what is fat? So fat or lipids are an energy source which can be stored efficiently in multiple compartments throughout the body for long-term energy storage. So the World Health Organization then defined obesity as the abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to our health. So the most common way that we uh, define this, which I'm sure all of you will be aware of, is through uh, body mass index, so dividing our weight by our height squared. So the different BMI categories are shown on the table on the right here. And uh, on the table, we have the um, associated risk of developing health problems. So as you might expect, as BMI increases above, above normal weight, so too does the risk of developing different uh, cardiometabolic comorbidities, such as uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, and then leading to cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So obesity is then defined as a BMI of greater than or equal to 30. So on a uh, large scale population basis, BMI can be a useful tool, but there are some well-known limitations. One of the most prominent being it's unable to really answer the question, why is it that some individuals with obesity can uh, remain metabolically healthy? And on the flip side, why is it that some individuals uh, with normal weight uh, can be metabolically unhealthy? And this is where the importance of where our body fat is distributed becomes really important. And BMI is unable to differentiate between these. So uh, fat not used uh, or excess um, fat not used for energy is primarily stored in adipose tissue as triglyceride. So whilst the main, uh, whilst the main function of adipose tissue is long term energy storage, it also provides uh, protection to our vital organs and also acts as an insulation layer to maintain our core body temperature. It's also an endocrine organ which can produce a variety of different hormones, uh, which have a number of different roles within the body. So most of this um, adipose tissue is distributed as subcutaneous adipose tissue, meaning uh, located just below the layer of skin. And this can be located throughout the body. And actually what we see is that there is a massive inter-individual differences between uh, individuals as to where we tend to store most of our body fat. And there's a number of different factors which influence this. But at the most basic level, we can split our body fat distribution into the upper and lower body. So individuals with obesity who tend to store more fat in the upper body is referred to as android obesity, and individuals with obesity who tend to store more fat in the lower body is referred to as gynoid obesity. And you may have heard these more commonly referred to as apple and pear shapes. So importantly, individuals with the android or apple shape tend to accumulate more fat around uh, their trunk, so more specifically the abdominal region, which we refer to as central obesity. And this body fat distribution is associated with a comparatively higher cardiometabolic risk, and that includes the, uh, the cardiometabolic comorbidities I mentioned earlier. And then um, on the opposite side, the uh, gynoid or pear shape is characterized by fat accumulation within the lower body around the hips and thighs, and this is thought to be more protective, acting as a buffer from the more harm harmful central fat accumulation. And this is associated with a lower cardiometabolic risk. So as I'm sure you can tell from the stick figures, the um, apple shape tends to be more common in males and the pear shape tends to be more common in females. But there are some nuances to this. So now I just want to focus a little bit more on this more harmful central fat accumulation. And using imaging methods such as MRI, we can differentiate between the different um, fat storage sites within the central region. So on the diagram on the right here, we firstly have at the most superficial level, intra-abdominal subcutaneous adipose tissue, and this is shown by the number one. So going deeper than this, we then have what's called visceral adipose tissue, and this is um, located deeper within the central region around the vital organs. This is a much, has a much smaller storage capacity. Importantly, uh, visceral fat has a, a comparatively higher cardiometabolic risk attached to it. And then finally, we have ectopic fat, which literally means fat stored where it's not meant to be. So ectopic fat can accumulate in organs such as the liver, pancreas, uh, skeletal muscle and heart. And importantly, 
um, ectopic fat accumulation in these sites not designed for mass lipid storage can then mean that the cells become stressed and inflamed. And over time, the cells can then begin to die, a process called apoptosis. And then the cells become replaced with fibrous tissue leading to fibrosis. And this is a key factor in the development of cardiometabolic diseases like cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So it's really this ectopic fat which carries the greatest cardiometabolic risk and is a real underpinning factor determining our cardiometabolic health. So the image on the right here is taken from one of our research study uh, patients and just quite nicely shows the distinction between the um, superficial layer of subcutaneous fat and then the deeper um, visceral fat located in green. So let's go back to the question that I posed at the beginning. Why is it that some individuals with obesity can remain metabolically healthy? And this is what's referred to as metabolically healthy obesity. So it's present in around 10 to 20 percent of individuals with obesity, with the other 80 to 90 percent having one or more cardiometabolic comorbidities, such as hypertension, dyslipidemia and insulin resistance. So what the authors did is they uh, took a sample of individuals with obesity and phenotyped them into a metabolically healthy group and a metabolically unhealthy group. So as you can see, both um, the two groups had the same BMI. But what they found is that the metabolically healthy group had a lower visceral fat volume and also lower amounts of ectopic fat within the liver. So both of those more harmful fat storage sites. And then um, on the opposite side, they then had higher amounts of, as I mentioned, the more protective uh, lower body leg fat. And this was associated with higher cardiorespiratory fitness and physical activity levels, which we know is an important factor uh, determining body fat distribution. And also these indi individuals were more insulin sensitive, had normal uh, levels of inflammatory markers and also normal adipose tissue functioning. So really what we see is it's this uh, visceral fat and ectopic fat accumulation, which is a real underpinning factor determining the metabolically unhealthy phenotype. However, is it all good news for individuals with metabolically healthy obesity? So what the authors did here is they summarized um, previous studies which uh, compared the risk of these different health outcomes on the graph and compared the risk to a metabolically healthy lean group. So the lean individuals are shown by the uh, black bar with the horizontal uh, dotted line. So this is a relative risk of one. So anything above this horizontal line indicates a greater risk of these health outcomes relative to the lean group. So the metabolically healthy obesity group are the light grey bars and the metabolically unhealthy group are the dark grey bars. So firstly, what we can see is that for every single um, health outcome, the greatest risk is seen in the group with metabolically unhealthy obesity. But what's interesting is when we compare the metabolically healthy obesity group to the lean individuals, we see that for some of the outcomes, the relative risk is still elevated. So this is for outcomes such as cardiovascular disease, um, heart failure, cardiovascular events, and also instant type 2 diabetes. And you can see the relative risk is fivefold greater still. And what other studies have shown is that this metabolically healthy phenotype appears to be transient. So within the next 10 years or so, up to 50% of these individuals can then progress uh, to metabolically unhealthy obesity. So really, from a clinical perspective, the um, sort of take-home messages from this really are that Obviously, um, a priority needs to be in those with obesity who have more severe metabolic complications. However, those with metabolically healthy obesity aren't off the hook and weight loss or more specifically body fat loss is still an important factor to reduce uh, the risk of these different health outcomes. But the site of ectopic fat accumulation that I want to focus on today and is also my main area of research is ectopic fat accumulation within the liver. So the liver has a really important role in energy metabolism, so it regulates our blood glucose and blood lipid levels. So maintaining a healthy liver is really important for normal functioning of the body. So fat is stored in liver cells or hepatocytes as lipid droplets. And we can have a look at this by taking a sample of liver tissue using a liver biopsy. And then we can stain uh, the cells and look at it under a microscope. So this is what a healthy uh, liver appears like under the microscope and lipid droplets are shown as the uh, white blobs here. 
So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is diagnosed when these lipid droplets are visible in more than 5% of liver cells. So under the microscope, this is what fatty liver would look like. So you can see the appearance of a lot more of the uh, white lipid droplets. But as I'm sure you can imagine, liver biopsy uh, techniques are quite invasive. So we can also assess this non-invasively using both magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI, and also magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And a liver fat percentage above 5.5% is diagnosed as NAFLD. So NAFLD itself actually represents a spectrum of different liver diseases, starting out as uh, fatty liver, what we've been talking about. And then in 10 to 30% of these individuals, they can progress and the cells can become inflamed and start to bloom, which is called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. Then in a subset of these individuals, um, the cells can become fibrotic, known as fibrosis. And this carries a much greater risk of progressing to end-stage liver disease, um, which we have here as cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, which is liver cancer. But in addition to this uh, greater risk of end-stage liver disease, NAPLD is also associated with a greater risk of not only overall mortality, but also the development of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and the metabolic syndrome. But when, not only when we look at NAPLD itself, but also when we specifically focus on liver fat, liver fat has been shown to be the strongest predictor of insulin resistance in both uh, the liver, the skeletal muscle, and the adipose tissue. And this is in comparison to the other fat storage sites, which we spoke about earlier, so visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. So it's really this ectopic uh, fat accumulation in the liver, which appears to be a strong factor underpinning our metabolic health. But emerging evidence sort of over the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so has started to suggest that it's not only the total amount of fat, but it's also the composition of liver fat, which may be important, or if not more important, for our metabolic health. So similar to the um, fat which we can consume in our diet, liver fat can be stored as saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fat. And numerous cell culture and animal studies have uh, begun to show that saturated fat may be more metabolically harmful. So it may trigger uh, inflammation and stress within our cells, leading to apoptosis, which can also um, inhibit insulin signaling. And on the flip side, polyunsaturated fat may be more protective. So it's been found to promote uh, fat oxidation within the liver and also inhibit the conversion of fat from other macronutrients through a process called de novo lipogenesis. So we've recently written a review on this topic, which is due to be available online in the next couple of weeks. So if anyone is interested in reading a bit more, then please do keep an eye out for that. But possibly the, um, the best uh, evidence that we've got in humans to date was a study in 2016 by a group from Finland. So what they did was they recruited 125 patients with severe obesity undergoing bariatric surgery. And the patients had consented during the surgery to give a small sample of liver tissue to be analysed for fat composition. And the authors then divided the 125 patients into two different groups. So the first group was a, uh, individuals who had a metabolic form of NAFLD. So this is the NAFLD that we've been talking about that's linked with um, hypertension, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance. And then also um, the second group was a group with genetic NAFLD. So this is a variation in the PMP LA3 gene. And what's interesting about these individuals is that they typically present a fatty liver, but don't have the accompanying metabolic comorbidities. So what this comparison allows us to look at is what is it within NAFLD which might be driving the poorer metabolic health in the metabolic NAFLD group. So uh, these are two different heat maps showing the different fatty acids within the liver. So looking at the x-axis, uh, the zero and one double bonds is representative of saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids. And then any uh, numbers above uh, two to 11 represent polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the stronger the red color indicates a higher proportion of these fatty acids, and the stronger the blue color represents a lower proportion of these fatty acids. So what they found in the metabolic NAFLD group is that the liver was enriched with both saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids shown uh, in the zero to one columns. When you compare this to the genetic NAFLD group, 
they found that their livers were enriched with uh, more polyunsaturated fatty acids. And you can see that in the genetic natural group that there's this dark blue color around both the saturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So it appeared that this more unhealthy lipid profile of high saturated fat and low polyunsaturated fat could potentially be driving the poorer metabolic health within the metabolic natural group. So um, how do we actually assess liver fat composition? So as they did in the prior, previous study, the gold standard method is the liver biopsy technique. But as we've um, alluded to previously, it is an invasive procedure, which um, isn't really feasible within research where it is voluntary participation, but also for taking repeat measurements, for example, before and after interventions, where uh, obviously requires multiple measurements. But an exciting new development over the last 10 years or so has been the development of an advanced uh, spectroscopy technique, which means that we're now able to non-invasively determine the amount of saturated, unsaturated and polyunsaturated fat in the liver. So to briefly explain uh, sort of the premise behind how this works, on the left here, we have a spectroscopy scan of the liver. And what we typically get is a large peak around uh, five parts per million. And this refers to the amount of water in the liver. We then also get six uh, smaller peaks, which relate to the um, different types of fat within the liver. So specifically, peak one and peak three relate to unsaturated fat in the liver. And then peak two relates exclusively to polyunsaturated fat. So by expressing these as a proportion of the total amount of fat within the liver, we can then use validated equations to calculate uh, indices of liver saturation, unsaturation and polyunsaturation. So uh, using this novel technique, we've developed two research questions that we want to answer here at Loughborough. So in individuals with NAFL, does liver fat composition differ in those with type 2 diabetes, i.e. Uh, have poorer metabolic health, compared to those without type 2 diabetes and then also tying in the lifestyle factors can exercise training favorably alter liver fat composition so to answer these questions we've been running the deliver study which stands for diabetes exercise and liver fat and this study looks at the impact of type 2 diabetes and exercise on liver fat composition so the study is divided into two parts to answer the two research questions which we've come up with so the first part is a cross-sectional comparison of liver fat composition in men with NAFL, both with and without type 2 diabetes. And then the second part of the study is taking the group of men with type 2 diabetes and putting them through a six-week exercise training randomised control trial. So for part A, the results I'm going to present here differ slightly from just solely uh, individuals with type 2 diabetes. We also included individuals with pre-diabetes. So the first group is a group with normal glucose regulation, which we divide, defined as a HbA1c of less than 42. And then a second group with impaired glucose regulations. This is a HbA1c of above or equal to 42. So this indicates uh, both pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Additional inclusion criteria were men aged 30 to 75, a BMI and waist circumference in the overweight or obesity categories, uh, the absence of excessive alcohol intake or other secondary causes of fatty liver. And this was to ensure that it was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that we were looking at. And then finally, those that did have type 2 diabetes were then treated by lifestyle modification and or metformin only. So we firstly screened uh, the participants over the phone to determine their eligibility. And those that were eligible were then invited to a first study visit. And this took place at the Sir Peter Mansfield Imaging Centre in Nottingham. So at this visit, we took basic anthropometric measures, and then the participants also had a combined MRI and MRS scan to look at not only the total amount of liver fat, but also uh, the composition of liver fat. So those that then had the, were above the clinical threshold for NAFL, so at 5.5%, uh, they then underwent seven days of physical activity monitoring and a three-day food record. This was to give us an insight into their habitual physical activity and dietary habits. They then uh, visited um, for a second time at the Leicester Diabetes Centre. And at this visit, we took a fasting blood sample um, to look at fasting glucose, insulin, uh, lipids, liver enzymes, and also uh, for pathology to um, analyse HbA1c for their group allocation. So they then also had a walking uh, incremental exercise test. 
And this was to determine their VO2 max or cardiorespiratory fitness. So the final group allocation was 12 in the normal glucose regulation and 15 in the impaired glucose regulation group. So what we found was really in line with our original hypothesis. So looking at uh, graph A, what we found was that the impaired glucose regulation group had a higher saturation index than the normal glucose regulation group. So this means that they had a greater proportion of saturated fat within their liver. And this was then, um, the opposite was then found for the unsaturation and polyunsaturation index. So the group with impaired glucose regulation had a lower proportion of both unsaturated and polyunsaturated fat. What was then interesting is when we looked at the associations within the group as a whole between liver fat composition and both uh, fitness levels and also physical activity levels. So the graphs here show uh, cardiorespiratory fitness on the y-axis and the different ind indices on the uh, y, uh, sorry, x-axis. And what these show is that having a higher saturation index and lower unsaturation and polyunsaturation index was associated with a lower cardiorespiratory fitness. And then similar associations were found uh, between having a higher liver fat saturation index, which was associated with spending more time sedentary and lower moderate to vigorous physical activity levels. So what this is doing is potentially giving us an insight into how long-term exercise and physical activity habits may be able to influence our liver fat composition. <clears throat> And this leads nicely onto uh, part B of the study, which then takes the individuals with type 2 diabetes uh, from part A into part B. So this is uh, when the participants are randomized to six weeks of exercise training or a control intervention, which is maintaining their normal physical activity and dietary habits. So the exercise training itself is 30 to 45 minutes of walking or cycling, 70 to 75 percent max heart rate, so a moderate sort of intensity. And then this is four sessions per week, three of which are supervised and one which they do at home unsupervised. But unfortunately, I can't present the results today because the study has been delayed due to COVID-19 um, and we're hoping to finish within the next year or so. So hopefully uh, I'll have some results to present then. But what we can do is look at what preliminary evidence shows from uh, other evidence within the literature. So this study um, here was published in 2013 in the Journal of Clinical called endocrinology and metabolism and it looked at the effects of uh, short-term exercise on liver fat composition in men with NAFLD. So they recruited 17 individuals with a mean age of 54, a BMI in the obesity category and also a liver fat of 19%, so quite far above that 5.5% threshold that we spoke about. So the uh, participants did seven consecutive days of 60 minutes of treadmill walking at 85% of their max heart rate. So uh, slightly longer sessions and also more intense sessions than the DELIVER study, but it was obviously for a much, much shorter duration. And typically what you'd expect with such uh, short exercise duration is that there were no changes in body weight. However, the short-term exercise was able to increase increase the proportion of polyunsaturated lipid within the liver. So it's really promising that such a short period of exercise can favorably alter liver fat composition. So this study was a uh, newer study published more recently, and it compared the um, effects of a comprehensive lifestyle intervention versus a soy protein based meal replacement regimen on liver fat composition. So for this study, they recruited 22 individuals with NASH, so that more severe form of liver disease that we were talking about. And again, a mean age of 52, BMI in the obesity category, and a liver fat of 17%. So the 22 individuals were then equally randomized to the two different interventions. So the first was the soy protein-based meal replacement regimen. So this involved replacing uh, normal daily meals with one to two shakes per day, uh, equaling 1,000 to 1,700 kilocalories per day, depending on sex and the length of time that they've been within the study. And this spanned over a 24 week period. The other group uh, took part in a lifestyle change intervention. So this was reducing uh, their normal meals to 1,200 to 1,800 kilocalories per day, while also taking part in one to two exercise classes per week and a lifestyle education class every six weeks. 
So obviously a much longer intervention, so they saw a much more substantial weight loss. And what they found was that both of these uh, lifestyle interventions, including both exercise and calorie restriction, were able to reduce the proportion of saturated fat within the liver. So again, favorably altering liver fat composition. So really the take home messages um, from the talk today are really that all fat is not equal. So storing fat centrally, particularly in ectopic areas such as the liver is associated with a greater cardiometabolic risk. And going back to this metabolically healthy obesity phenotype that we're talking about, which is characterized by the more healthier um, fat storage profile in the lower body, may only be a transient state and still carries greater health risks when compared to metabolically healthy normal weight individuals. So sort of the clinical um, importance here is that weight loss or more specifically body fat loss is still important in these individuals with metabolically healthy obesity. And then when specifically focusing on ectopic fat accumulation within the liver, again, all fat may not be equal. So storing liver fat as saturated fat may be more metabolically harmful, whilst polyunsaturated fat may be more protective. And based on the research that we've been doing here at Loughborough, um, NAPLD with impaired glucose regulation is characterized by higher saturated uh, liver fat and lower polyunsaturated liver fat. So it could potentially be this lipid profile, which um, could be driving some of the uh, metabolic complications which we see within NAFLD. And finally, initial evidence from both our own observations and also preliminary evidence from the literature is promising that lifestyle interven interventions through both exercise and diet may be able to favorably change our liver fat composition. So that's just quickly a whistle-stop tour of some of the research that we've been doing around uh, fat storage location. Um, here at Loughborough. So thank you for listening. And um, if you've got any questions after the session and after the Q&A, then please feel free to um, give me an email or contact me on the details on the screen. So I'll now pass over to um, Professor Letty Bishop, who's going to be doing the final session of um, the series today. Over to you, Letty. Thanks, Scott. Just share my screen. There we go. Can you can you just put your thumb up for me, Scott? If you can see that, I'll say hello. You can see it. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi everyone. So um, thanks ever so much to James and to um, Scott for their fantastic talks there. And actually, it's almost like the plan this because the things that they've been talking about, energy and expenditure and um, fat distribution time really well with what I'm going to talk to you all about now. Um, so my name is Professor Letty Bishop uh, and I'm a Professor of Exercise in Immunology at Loughborough University. So my research is to look at how um, the amount of activity that you do affects your immune system and that's not just about infection but it's also a key player in chronic low-grade inflammation. So my um, talk today is going to have three main um, areas. The first thing get some context in is the burden of chronic inflammation. Um, and then we're going to look at whether physical activity can actually be anti-inflammatory therapy. And after we've looked at that, we'll look at the question which kind of everyone wants to know is how much or just how little do we need to do to actually get these benefits. So we start off with the, the burden of chronic inflammation. Now many of you will be aware of this, um, this relationship that we um, it has become more and more established that this chronic low-grade inflammation, which is characterized by a sustained elevation in um, inflammatory proteins in the blood, is now underpinning the development and also um, the continuation of many, many long-term conditions. And these ones here we now know are, are associated with chronic systemic inflammation, but the list is growing all the time. And what you can see from here, it's not just things like heart disease and stroke, that were perhaps the most, um, the ones that people thought of initially, perhaps also the ones that have the most attention, but we also know things like dementias, one of the sorts of people that liver disease, bowel disease, certain cancers. Um, all of these things also have chronic inflammation underlying their pathology. And the reason why this is so important is because this overactivation of the immune system or this 
um, unwanted activation of the immune system can have these far um, reaching effects. One of the things that happens when you get this overactivation is you get inflammatory cytokine production. Now, this isn't actually always a bad thing. It's an essential part of our repair mechanisms. We need it to, um, to repair damage and also to repair things after we have an infection. Problem is, if it doesn't get switched off, and this is what happens with this chronic low grade inflammation. So you get cytokines being produced, such as things like gamma alpha, and something called interleukin 6, and they have these far reaching effects. They can cause insulin resistance, they can affect and um, cause anemia, they can cause um, dysregulation in iron. Insulin resistance, the um, relation to diabetes, they stimulate the liver to release these other inflammatory markers, CRP, um, C reactive protein, and fibrinogen. They stimulate an, an adipocrine production from um, adipocytes. So we've been talking about the fact that there. Um, and they can also cause immune cells to want to go into the adipocytes rather than release more of these um, inflammatory cytokines, which is a bit like a cascade, and we'll talk about that a bit more. They're related to decreased appetite, far reaching effects in the vascular system, so for endothelial dysfunction, uh, lesion of the, um, immune cells, oxidative stress, calcification of vascular tissue, smoothness, proliferation. And then we have effects as well in the bone and in the muscle, causing conditions like osteoporosis, fatigue, sarcopenia, so um, related them to frailty. So it's not just about having high levels of IL-6 and maybe causing um, some short-term problems. You can see that the burden is, is, has quite a large reach. So it's important that we try and do something about it. For a long time now, we've known that these small yet sustained increases in these inflammatory proteins are having a negative effect on your risk for developing things like cardiovascular disease. Um, and this is a study which is almost 20 years old now that looked at around 350 apparently healthy women and looked at their risk factors for future development of cardiovascular disease, um, such as being over 60, being a smoker, having a sedentary lifestyle. BMI in the overweight range and solid blood um, pressure of over 140 in the presence of diabetes. And as you have more of these risk factors, your interleukin 6 levels in your blood increase. And it's the same for another very commonly used biomarker and inflammatory biomarker called CRP or C reactive protein. And again, the more of these risk factors that you had, the greater the um, CRP that was in your blood. So this has actually given us an idea of where we need to target. So if we know that these, um, these are a real problem, then what we need to be able to do is try and target them to try and reduce the um, incidence of cardiovascular disease. So this was the first study that actually showed there was cause and effect in all of this. It was a study that looked at over 10,000 patients, I and mean, they've all had a previous heart attack, and they had uh, or myocardial infarction and had CRP levels of over two milligrams per liter. What they did was they gave a um, monoclonal antibody treatment, which was given every three months or a placebo, which actually targeted one of the inflammatory pathways, actually blocked one of those pathways. And this is what they found is that the therapy reduced the levels of CRP and it also reduced the incidence of heart attack, stroke, or cardiovascular death after four years. And what is also important is it didn't actually have an effect on their blood lipid levels. As you can see here, this is the hazard ratio for a cardiovascular event after three, um, after nearly four years. And this is higher doses here, 150 and 300 milligrams, that were associated with this decreased risk. You can want... Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway. So compared with a risk of, um, uh, compared with the placebo, this risk was um, around 15% lower at these higher levels after four years. So this is the first study that directly related the um, uh, inflammatory pathways to the development of cardiovascular disease. So that's telling you about the burden of chronic inflammation. If we now know what's going on with chronic inflammation, we know how it's developing physical activity for the anti-inflammatory therapy. 
Now, it's really unlikely that physical activity would ever be as strong as pharmacological treatment like the monoclonal antibodies that we used in that previous study. But there is certainly the potential that physical activity may um, complement those therapies by having an anti-inflammatory effect. And maybe in the future, we might be able to see reduced doses for those sorts of pharmacological therapies being used if they're used alongside physical activity. So this is showing the reason why. In a healthy diet and physical activity, you've got adipocytes of a decent size. You've got these immune cells that live in, um, that are resident inside the adipose tissue. And you've got a really nice blood supply, so lots of oxygen. So these immune cells aren't overactivated, they're just doing their job. But with inactivity and positive energy balance, you get an increase in visceral fat accumulation. So what happens is you get these bigger adipocytes. The blood supply is stretched more over the tissue, so you get hypoxia. It stresses the immune cells out, and they start to become overactivated. When you get this overactivation, you get an increase in the pro inflammatory cytokines. You get a change in the lipid profile, and ultimately you'll end up with chronic low grade inflammation being um, developing, which can lead to all those conditions that I mentioned before decreased functional capacity and also reduced longevity. Now, knowing that information allows us now to start looking at whether if we increase physical activity levels, can we actually lower our levels of inflammatory cytokines? Now, given that there is this um, relationship with fat mass, it seems sensible to think that inflammation and anti measurements will also follow the same trend. So in this study um, by Vela, which was published a couple of years ago, they looked at nearly 2,000 people, men and women, in fact, 50 percent and men, 50 percent women, and they, these were a group of people who were all, the um, majority of which were overweight, so the mean BMI was um, 27, um, so the majority of which were overweight. What they looked at was they did self-recording of physical activity levels, and this split these up into four quartiles. And what they were really interested in was how these quartiles, the difference between um, these anthropometric measurements occurred across these quartiles, and um, when they looked specifically in moderate vigorous physical activity levels. When we talk about moderate vigorous physical activity levels, it's not really a standard definition, but it's probably in my mind um, something like brisk walking, where you can have a conversation and you're taking a breath at the end of each sentence, but not so much that you need to take a breath after each word. So you can keep up that sort of level of conversation. The so quartile one was the one with the least amount of this moderate vigorous activity, and quartile four with the most. And as you can see, it's waist circumference, subcutaneous fat area, and visceral fat area all increase across the quartiles. Um, they, I'm oh, sorry, they all increase across those quartiles of physical activity. So the more activity, lower across those quartiles of physical activity, so the more activity you did, the lower waist circumference, the fat area, and the visceral fat area as well. Now, this is quite important because when we looked at when we looked at the cytokine levels, the same thing happened. Now, one reason why you could suggest this might be the case is simply because if adipose tissue is a major site of these inflammatory cytokines, then certainly does not make sense that if you've got more of this fat and this more fat distribution in visceral and subcutaneous areas, you're going to have more source or more place to actually. Um, release this, these inflammatory cytokines from. And that certainly is a sensible way to look at it, and it is a major source. But it's not surprising that as we got increasing anthropometric markers with, um, with lower levels of activity, those with the highest levels of activity also want to have lower levels of all these other inflammatory markers as well. However, if we're just thinking these inflammatory markers are higher simply because the least factors had the most adipose tissue, then the easiest way to solve chronic inflammation would be to lose fat mass. But it's not the case because if you think about the studies that we've seen with the monoclonal antibody, those findings are independent of lipid levels. And when the Vela study started trying to adjust for lipid levels and um, they adjusted for fat mass, they also found that 
the relationship between the amount of activity people are doing, so quartile one was the lowest, so here quartile two, three, and four, these ones doing the most moderate risk uh, activity, you still saw a decreased mile six levels and it's independent of their fat mass. So it's, although fat mass is really, really important because it is a major source, it isn't the only thing that's going on. It can't just be because you've got more sites. Something else is happening. And we now know what this might be. Because we now know that physical activity can affect other sources of inflammatory cytokines. So some of the studies that have looked at this have shown now that inflammatory immune cells will change. Inflammatory immune cells can change what they produce and how they act depending on how much physical activity you do. So this is a study looking at um, inflammatory monocytes in older men and women who were inactive. And what they did was over a 12-week period, they got a group of people who were inactive and they got them involved in a supervised exercise program three times a week, around an hour, a mixture of aerobic and resistance exercise. And they compared this with a group of a similar age who were already physically active. And what they found was these inflammatory immune cells, the ones that are releasing a lot of these inflammatory cytokines that are causing the um, problems, they found that they could decrease that by being involved in this exercise program. So there were high levels in the inactive group compared with the active group at rest. And then after they'd done the exercise, there was a significant decrease. So this 12-week intervention decreased the amount of these inflammatory monocytes. Now, this is really important because when they actually then stimulated the monocytes, then what they were able to find was that these monocytes actually then released less of these inflammatory cytokines. So it wasn't just the fact you had less of the monocytes that released them, when you got them to release them from the cytokine, in that they released less. So here we go, nothing, no difference with the interactive groups, with the inactive group much lower after the um, exercise program. Go back on and get rid of that. Right, okay. I'm sorry about this. I can't seem to actually get rid of this of the screen. I don't know if you've seen that as well. I do apologize. So now I wanted to show you some of our data looking at um, physical activity in a patient population. And what we did, we work um, a lot with the patients at the um, hospitals. So there's a big kidney population down there. These are patients with chronic kidney disease. And what we wanted to do is look at our patients with chronic kidney disease who are in early stage. These are people who aren't on dialysis, don't need any stage um, replacement therapy. These are people who have got early stage um, chronic kidney disease, which is associated with chronic inflammation and also associated with high risk of cardiovascular disease. And what we wanted to show was that when we were doing, what we got people to do was increase the amount of work that they were doing it was over a six month period. By the end of the six months, we wanted people to be able to walk for 30 minutes at a, a risk of more moderate, moderate vigorous pace. And what we found was that by the time they'd done this six month exercise and we looked again, those that were in our exercise group saw a decrease in the numbers of activated inflammatory cells in blue. Whereas those that carried on with their usual care and their usual activity levels saw um, slight increases, which is what you would possibly expect given their chronic kidney disease. Now, this was really nice because what we also then found, what we also then found was that the amount of interleukin-6 and interleukin-10 in the blood also changed. It is important. Interleukin-6 is highly pro-inflammatory, 
interleukin 10 is anti inflammatory. So, this shows that with exercise, your inflammatory status actually is decreasing because they're getting less of interleukin 6. And we actually found they're producing more interleukin 10. So, it's anti inflammatory, which was switching off the inflammatory response. So, not only are you getting more of the, um, the, the benefits of actually doing the exercise, you're also, you're also increasing quality of life. From an inflammatory point of view, you're getting fewer of the activated cells that cause or release these inflammatory cytokines that cause all the problems. And you can see that in the blood because the inflammatory status will vastly improve. Now, this was all happening in the blood. And one of the most important things you have to realize is that you're measuring things in the blood. It doesn't necessarily tell us what's going to happen in the tissue. And one of the key events in inflammation is the actual movement of cells that are in the blood, these blood inflammatory cells, into the tissue itself, be that vascular tissue or be that um, adipose tissue. And as that's such a key event, it's probably quite important for you to know whether migration, this movement of the cells, is also affected um, by the amount of activity that you do. So normally what happens is you've got your adipose uh, cells here, here's your blood, um, blood vessel, and in conditions of nutrient excess or hypoxia, which cause inflammation, your adipose um, tissue cells, your adipocytes, will release inflammatory cytokines. And they will act almost like a magnet, telling these inflammatory cells here, those monocytes, to leave the blood and enter the um, adipose tissue itself. Once they're in the adipose tissue, they kind of get kept there. They, they um, are exposed to different inflammatory cytokines, which then form make them mature into um, more inflammatory cells themselves. It's almost like a cascade where these cells, the adipocytes are, show, um, are trying to get the monocytes to come into the, into the um, adipose tissue. And once they're there, they get converted and become more inflammatory themselves. So if you can perhaps prevent this step, this migration, then you might go some way to actually preventing the tissue level inflammation itself. This is something you want to look at. So in this study that we are doing with um, my colleague Alex Wadley, we got some inflammatory immune cells, we took blood samples, and we put the inflammatory immune cells um, in this model of migration. So we had like a well, and in the top of the well, we had inflammatory immune cells. So we had a mixture of immune cells in the blood that were more inflammatory. And we had this little well on an orbital shaker, so we broke the shape to kind of mimic the movement of the blood. Now, at the bottom of the well is semi-primary membrane. So this is kind of um, mimicking the blood vessel wall. And what we really hoped was that these cells would want to stick to this semi-primary membrane blood vessel wall and move through. Now, the movement through would be enhanced by having this chemokine mix. So this is like the, this is like the infantry cytokines that the blood tissue, the blood, um, sorry, the adipose tissue releases to try and encourage monocytes to move into the tissue. So by having this well where we have the blood on top, and we have a same kind of layer like this, like the blood wall, and these chemokines and magnets underneath try and pull the monocytes through, we we're able to see how many monocytes actually start moving towards the edge of the blood vessel and how many of those actually move through or migrated. And what we also did, we recorded physical activity outcomes um, by accelerometry just to see if there was any relationship between the movement of the cells and the amount of activity that people were doing. And these are our key findings. What we actually found was that migration was greater in people who had central obesity. So just being um, obese, central obesity, your immune cells were more likely to move out of circulation and into adipose tissue. But it wasn't all bad news because we found that those people with central obesity who had higher levels of physical activity, their immune cells didn't move as much. So this effect of obesity on encouraging your cells to move out of circulation can be kind of switched off by doing more physical activity. And we think the reason for that is it affects how well the cells are able to stick to the blood vessel wall which they need to do to move through. So that's showing you how physical activity can be an anti-inflammatory therapy. But I guess the question that a lot of people want to know is how much or how little do you actually need to do to get benefit? 
So this is a study which shows that essentially you don't need to do an awful lot. A lot of the early studies always concentrated on moderate vigorous physical activity, almost being like the benchmark, but more recently it's become a little bit more nuanced. This particular study was only in 16 people, but it looked at a 16 week education program with the aim to reduce sitting time by 30 minutes a day and also to increase the levels of light activity. So they like walking and standing up more. That's all they wanted to do. So in this, these two figures here, I'm showing you these inflammatory cytokines, interleukin 1 and interleukin 6. And the key take home message is we've got this negative relationship. So as they increase the amount of walking time per day, the cytokine levels are going down. And this one over here looks a little bit more messy simply because they've got, they um, just use two different ways of uh, uh, assessing the interleukin 6. But if you look at this box again, what it's showing down this area here is that the increase in um, walking time hours per day associated with large increase in release of interleukin 6. Now, what's really important is that his point here is one hour. And we've got a lot of benefit happening just by doing less than an hour. Even half an hour. So it just kind of illustrates that doing something will have an effect. It might be that doing a bit moderate vigorous physical activity has a greater effect, but for many people that's a barrier. Thinking you've got to do that to even get a benefit and not switch some people up even trying. But we're now knowing that just doing something means you can get a benefit. So this has kind of shifted how we're thinking about all this. Maybe it's not just about the intensity of the physical activity. Maybe you shouldn't be so fixated on moderate physical, um, moderate physical, physical activity. Maybe it's more about just how much you move. And this is illustrated quite nicely in this um, study that was published a couple of years ago. They looked at 1,600 men and women who were um, 60 to 64 years old, and they looked at the amount of time they spent in different levels of physical activity. Now, not surprisingly, they found that moderate vigorous physical activity was associated with low inflammatory markers, as we found before. But the first time they were actually showing that doing light physical activity, very light walking, um, maybe just doing um, walking around the house, nothing, no over exercise, nothing um, that causes you to get out of breath, that in itself is associated with low inflammatory markers. Now, for a lot of people, this is really, really encouraging. Not only that, they also found that if you could reduce your sitting time, then you could also have these beneficial effects because higher amounts of sitting time were associated with higher levels of interleukin 6, CRP, and markers of blood vessel inflammation. What was really, really important about this study is that they found this effect of sedentary um, behavior and light risk activity and inflammatory markers are independent how much high intensity activity you did. It basically means that it doesn't matter how much moderate vigorous physical activity you're doing. Just by reducing your sedentary time, regardless of what else you do, or just doing a little bit more light activity, regardless of what else you do, will give you beneficial effects. And this is really, really encouraging for those for whom um, there are barriers for exercise for maybe doing um, the recommended 150 minutes a week is quite a tall ask, it can be quite daunting. The recommendation that just doing something get a benefit is a great starting place. You know, so, you've got to so to summarize the recommendations um, and information that I've given you, we've talked about burning information, you know it underlies many long-term conditions. And I've tried to explain how this activity can be anti-inflammatory. And although the amount of fat you have in losing fat is really important because it's a major source of these inflammatory cytokines, it's not dependent on fat mass. And we know that being physically active now can change how your immune cells work. So they don't produce so many of these inflammatory cytokines. And not only that, it also changes how they move. So they don't want to go to the inflammatory tissues where they cause trouble so much. So just those two two main aspects is changing in cells or um, how they produce things and how they move can have great benefits in trying to dampen down this inflammatory response. And importantly, it's no longer necessary to do lots of activity to get any benefit. You can do small amounts of activity and still see benefits. So in terms of a recommendation, 
I always say just do what you can, whatever you like and whatever you want like to do. Because once you start doing those behaviors and things will then progress from there. So rather than encouraging people to try and go from nothing to 150 um, minutes a week, people should be supported um, to replace their time that's spent sitting down with any intensity of physical activity, just doing something and you'll see the benefits. Apologize again for um, the technical issues. In fact, I've had this some banner at the top of the screen, but we did give up. But thank you ever so much for listening. And thanks to everybody that I work with at Loughborough and um, at Leicester Hospitals and other institutions as well. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Letty. Nice to see an update of the literature around that area. Takes me back to my undergraduate days. <laughs> and thanks for Scott as well. That was a really nice, clear presentation as well. Um, I will open the floor to any questions. I'm aware there haven't been any as of yet. And also that quite a few people are probably waiting to get home and going to put the tea on or walk the dog. So we, we won't keep a long <laughs> track to the fair this evening. What I will do whilst there aren't no questions there, um, I'll just use the opportunity to plug the next session, which is in two weeks time. So that's on the 6th of October. And we'll have <clears throat> Professor Amanda Daly talking about uh, pace labeling. So the idea about putting um, um, sort of on the labels of food items, the amount of exercise or the duration of exercise necessary to burn off the calories in certain foods. We've got Dr. Nicola Payne talking about how stress links to physical health and Dr. Stacey Clems, who's giving an update on research relating to sedentary behavior and cardiometabolic health. Um, so that's in two weeks time. So still no questions. So oh, Chris, Chris, Chris. Oh, sorry, Chris, go for it, Chris. Sorry for keeping everyone a bit longer, but seeing as, uh, seeing as we're here, um, I thought I'd ask you a question, Scott. Um, about sort of fat storage in specific areas in, in the body. Um, can, you, can you debunk any myths about the well-known concept of the sort of the, the beer belly? Uh, is, is, if you, is it just a specific genetic uh, phenotype or body phenotype? Um, if someone over eight in terms of their energy in with different types of macronutrients, would they get the same sort of... Um, a storage of fat in the same area or is there something very specific to beer or alcohol yes so i think um that's a really good question it's i'd say it's more to do with um the other underlying factors so like you said obviously um genetics um sex does does play a big part as well um age is also a big factor in that so obviously we see um as you age uh the I guess distribution of fat does tend to um, locate towards the central region. Um, and that's also quite common um, in uh, oh, postmenopausal females as well. And so that's where the um, sex hormones can play a role as well. Um, in terms of uh, different macronutrients, um, in terms of directing towards uh, the, the beer belly, as you said, obviously. Um, what we visually see would mostly be obviously subcutaneous fat in that situation. Um, but we do know that, uh, for example, um, so uh, sugars such as obviously glucose, um, that's one macronutrient which the liver itself can um, directly convert to uh, saturated fatty acids through the process of de novo lipogenesis. So that's one macronutrient, for example, where um, it would, I guess, increase both liver fat and also the, it would alter the composition as well. So um, that's where probably both reducing saturated fat intake, but also carbohydrate intake as well would be able to um, alter both liver fat amount and also composition. Um, in terms of alcohol, I'm not uh, massively aware of um, it influencing, I guess, the distribution. So it could just be, obviously, with, with age, the alcohol consumption goes up in, um, let's say, middle age, which obviously coincides with the uh, increase in central fat accumulation. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. 
any other questions from anyone? There's still a few people lingering around. <laughs> 